All right, we're gonna get to our next speaker, uh, Rasmus Henningsen. Um, he is working in um, applied math and has been um, doing leukemia research. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about single cell projections.jl. Yeah, thank you very much for the, the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and see you all. Uh, so so as, uh, as we just heard, I will talk about this, uh, this package. And uh, it's registered, it's in GitHub, there is documentation and a tutorial. Uh, so the talk today uh, will not be focusing on how to use the package, it's rather I want to describe the, what's behind it. So you don't really need to know these things to use the package, but this is what I think is the fun part and where Julia really shines. So I think it has uh, implications beyond just this uh, um, single cell analysis. I think these are nice tools that could be useful in, in many, uh, many different other cases. So, but, but to set the scope, I will give a short introduction of what single cell sequencing is. Not, maybe not everyone has, uh, has worked with that or seen what it is. Um, so that's the, why do we need this package? Uh, and then an, another why do we, do we do this in Julia? And that's the benchmark part, as, as quite often the case. So, uh, and uh, the second part will be more how. So first, how can we achieve this? And um, the second part of how is, is how do we work a little bit more with the data? Some, some, uh, you saw projections in the name, so I want to talk about what that means in, in, in this context. And I think it's a, a useful tool um, that fits well in, into this. So, very, very, very brief introduction to single cell sequencing with, from someone doing applied math. Uh, so the idea here is that we can measure the abundance of transcripts so, uh, for many, many cells in parallel. So, so we think of this as a way to measure how active different genes are within e each and every cell. So uh, it's a pretty cool technology. You, take these small little droplets, you, you make sure there are some reagents in there, you make sure there's one cell in each one, you d destroy the cell, cut up the, the, uh, the mRNA molecules, and then small tags are attached to each of that, one of them, so you know which cell uh, each one came from. Uh, and then uh, you do a, an alignment step, so we know how the human genome looks like, we have the tag, we know uh, which cell it came from, and by by checking the rest of the sequence, we, we figure out which gene this came from in a very, very quick overview. So that's how we can uh, really get the data. And this is where my work starts uh, and the work when you use this package, just one big, rather sparse matrix uh, with integer counts. So uh, we have maybe 30,000 genes and the number of cells, of course, depends on how much money you have to spend. and uh, uh, how much data you are collecting, but this is growing very quickly. We can we are now seeing data sets with 500,000 cells or, or more. So so this is uh, it's starting to become a rather large uh, matrix here. And when I talk about sparse here, I'm saying maybe five ten percent of the of the data is is non-zero. So physicists doesn't think that's sparse, uh, but uh, but biologists maybe do. Um, and this is really. I mean, at some level, all we know of each cell when, when we start the analysis. Uh, everything else has to be derived from this. So let's, let's take a quick look at the standard workflow. I'm just using as an example how it looks like within my tool. It's very similar if you use a package in R or, or Python or something, but to set the, the scope of what kind of analysis uh, that we need to do here. So of course, we start with loading the data. Uh, so this is the matrix we saw on the previous slide. Then you will typically transform it because count data is not something you want to really work with that much. It has very uh, annoying statistical properties. Uh, the distributions are messy. So with quite a lot of hand waving, we do something nice and the data is starting to look more like it's normally distributed. So this is really allowing you to use a lot of more useful and common tools downstream of this. So uh, this is a key step. Um, the next thing you, you wanna do is at least you want to center the data, uh, remove the, the mean of each gene, but typically you will have some covariates that you maybe 
know from before somehow or that you estimated from the data that to remove some spurious pattern uh, like this common for instance with some uh, m you measure how many mitochondrial genes are active because that's a signal that's really use not very useful to have so this is uh, yeah really much uh, always used some kind of normalization and, and you regress out something then a key step is that you typically do SVD or principal component analysis uh, and this is to get the data down uh, to maybe five, 100 dimension or something like that. Uh, that gets rid of some noise and it also makes the data suddenly much more manageable in size, right? Uh, we, we got rid of orders of magnitude here. So, so now we can pass it on to other tools, etc. This is suddenly something we can can really work with. And for visualization purposes, 100 dimensions is still pretty messy. So you, people typically use UMAP, but there are a couple of other, TSNE or some force layout uh, that you apply at this stage to, to get something you can visualize. Like I, I wouldn't recommend doing the analysis on this level, but this is very useful for the visualization part. Um, and of course, uh, it's, uh, you, you typically want to do some differential expression uh, kind of analysis, statistical test on this data. What, how is this patient different from this patient? How is this type of cell different from this type of cell? These are common questions that arise all the time. So this functionality is also in there. I will not go into the details. Um, so benchmarks, we like to look at these plots here. And first is a kind of standard use case in this, how if you follow a tutorial on these other packages, this is how they, they will work with the data. You, one of the first steps you do is you throw away almost all the genes to make the data more manageable in size. Um, and uh, so I want to compare with what, what they are doing. And we can see that the single cell projections in blue is, is rather fast and uh, behaving nicely for the two uh, key steps here, the normalization step and the, uh, the principal component analysis or SVD. And I mean, this, what I'm comparing to, they are not having exactly the same features, but you have with or without regression and you have this, either you just log transform or you have a slightly more advanced uh, transform. Uh, so I think this is looking nice, but this is not what I want to do. I'm, I'm greedy. So I want to analyze all the genes, not only those 2,000. Uh, so if we go up to 20,000 genes, um, which is basically what's, I mean, we talked about the sparsity. This is more or less removing those with zero or, or just a, couple, a few um, elements in them. I'm, yeah, I'm not really sure what happened in that one. I, I tried it a couple of times. I couldn't get it to be faster, but I think they didn't really test much with, with using all the genes. Um, so the normalization uh, happened to be very slow, and that is the recommended use case. Remember that, like, you, you, no one will tell you to not do any regression on the data. That's kind of, you need to do that. Uh, so again, single cell projections are behaving pretty nicely across the spectra, and, and it's not much slower when you do more of these operations with normalization and, uh, yeah, transformation and normalization. Um, so, I, oh yeah, there is starting to be some out of memory error there as well in the, in the bottom right. So some analysis is not available and some are out of memory. If we move up to a little bit more of samples, so if we take three samples, suddenly we're out of memory everywhere. This is on my 32 gigabyte RAM laptop, so it's pretty decent, but uh, I, I couldn't get it to work. Uh, except one use case, which again is not the recommended way of analyzing the data. But three samples is a bit boring, so let's go move up to 20, and it's still working very well with single cell projections. Um, and uh, across the board that you can do every kind of analysis, and it's kind of the same speed. So the take home message here is that, I mean, the key feature that I want people to bring people in here. This is fast and memory efficient. And then that makes a difference regardless of how you're running it. If you're running it on your laptop, uh, it's a matter of if you can or not. If you run it on a cluster, well, you still prefer if it finishes within an hour instead of a week, or if you need a 
by a bigger cluster or whatever. So I mean, it's, regardless of your scale, these things matter. Um, and if we look at the memory, this is a kind of stupid plot because it's just linear, right? If you add more cells, you use more memory uh, and in a quite a linear fashion, but the constant is different depending on how you analyze the data. So these, uh, uh, we have the steeper uh, slope for these other packages, except for uh, this, uh, this one use case with the, with the sparse that uh, ScanPy could handle quite well, and, and single cell projections. This is just a matter of float 32 or float 64. That's a different slope, so you can, you can choose that if you really want to preserve memory. Um, so what, what's going on? This is the, now we're starting the, the fun part of the talk. Uh, so how, how can we achieve this? So what I hinted at maybe that um, the common strategy here for tools like uh, Surat in R and ScanPy in Python is to work with dense matrices because after, I mean, you start with a sparse matrix, but after doing just a little bit, it got too complicated. It's, you, you, you have too much structure and, and they end up with a dense matrix. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of easy to, to end up there. It makes uh, the code easier to handle, et cetera. But I think this is a strategy that we can easily see has some problems. So if we think about 30,000 genes and 500,000 cells, we are suddenly up to taking 120 gigabytes of ROM. And I mean, I want to add more cells. I want to add, this is, doesn't scale very well and makes it harder for people to analyze their own data. So, I mean, my whole idea coming into this is there gotta be structure here. We, it was sparse. We, we must be able to leverage that fact. So um, that's, that's what we're doing. And the way to do this is uh, to use matrix expressions. So this is a form of lazy evaluations of, of matrix uh, expressions. So the two core ideas here is that we never need to store a large dense matrix or compute one. Um, so, and everything we store in memory is either sparse or in some sense small, uh, at least orders of magnitude, fewer elements than that huge matrix that we're talking about. And the second idea is that we can, we can, we can do this because we only really, the, the key thing here is to compute matrix products. And that we can do even when, when we have an expression. We don't need the full evaluated matrix to do that. And then some technical, we need this other kind of, of expression as well. I will, I will get back to that. So, but the take care message is, well, it's better to store the expression than to evaluate it and, and store the large one. Uh, so as a motivating example, what's going on? How can we understand and this? Uh, think of this. Uh, I mean, this is the simplified, you want to do a bit more, but it, it captures the ideas. So you have your, your matrix S, which is the log transform counts, a very typical way of analyzing the data. And then you want to remove the, the mean of every gene. This is, I mean, you always do that when you do a, a PCA. So if you, if you just look at that, that's suddenly a dense matrix. We have a non-zero in every element, basically, but the thing to the right is just a rank one matrix. We can store that very efficiently. And if you're not doing matrices very much, I mean, just think of this, instead of storing the result, we store the, the idea that we have a sparse matrix and we remove the mean. So uh, we don't need to compute it, we just uh, postpone that. And in terms of matrix multiplication, which we said was very important to compute things, uh, what happens here is that we can take this matrix X we want to multiply with, and it distributes uh, over the sum or the minus there. And instead of being very expensive, if we had the dense matrix A times X, suddenly the sparse matrix times the, that's pretty okay. I mean, it's, it might not be super fast. We have a lot of, of cells, we have, but it's, it's much, much better, uh, in particular in terms of memory. And then this rank one thing, that's basically for free. We, compared to the other thing, that, that's nothing. Uh, so, so we went from something very expensive to something that's, that's quite okay. So the take home message, I'm putting it here again, the same one as before, because this is a key point, better to store the expression than to compute the large dense matrix. Um, 
so yeah, I, I basically mentioned this before that you, uh, using only the matrix multiplication, you don't need to know the exactly every element up front. You can co compute the SVD or principal component analysis any, anyway. There are plenty of algorithms for doing that. I have settled on, on something called randomized SVD because the idea is that you can kind of compute many uh, eigenvalues or singular values and singular vectors at the same time. So it kind of makes sense. You don't want to loop over this huge object too many times. You want to do it in as few passes as possible. But there, there might be some opportunity to fine tune this or, um, or to let the user choose depending on the, on the context. But this seems to be working pretty well. So um, the matrix expressions, I want to talk a bit more about how, what's happening under the hood when we use them. And it's really kind of a gradual ap approach here. We start, uh, if, if you again look at the log transform as, as the example, when we transform, uh, log transform the counts is still a sparse matrix if we do, so the trick is we do log transform of one plus the value that maps zero to zero, so it still comp keeps the same sparsity structure. Um, so we end up with a single matrix A there. And then we want to do some kind of regression on this. Uh, in, yeah, I decided to just uh, regress out the name of the sample here as a toy, toy example. And then uh, we end up with another, we just add one term or subtract one term. And this is that, uh, yeah, these are much smaller matrices in the number of terms of the number of elements. Uh, so this is how we kind of gradually as we add one more step in our analysis, we just manipulate the matrix expression a little bit, and, and then uh, we don't need to copy the matrix A, we don't need to do, so this is very efficient. This is basically, we, we not need to store more data or anything like this. Um, I, that's one, uh, and then just a, one common case you wanna do quite often is that you want to normalize the, sta uh, the variance to one for every gene. Uh, quite common in other disciplines as well. And I mean, again, this is, we're manipulating that matrix expression. In this case, we are multiplying with a diagonal matrix. It's important it's diagonal, right? That makes it uh, cheap to store it and cheap to use it. Uh, so again, we're storing very little information, uh, and, but we can express this uh, nicely. Um, so, so far, all I was showing were like, I think rather straightforward. I mean, if, if you work with dense matrices, you more or less do the same thing. You just compute it instead of uh, showing it. But here is a little bit more complicated example. Uh, and I want to highlight a couple of things rather than explaining exactly what this transform uh, is doing. But to, just to show that the idea is general enough to handle a bit more complicated use cases. Uh, so with, in this transform, you start with the counts, and then there is a model where you, uh, to, to figure out what should the mean and the standard deviation be for each cell and each gene. So these, you see the mean and standard deviation depend, are different here for each uh, gene and each cell. And this is really the problem, because the counts, again, that was sparse, we can handle that. So it's really the second part that we need to do something about. That's what's causing uh, other tools to choose to, to go to the dense case. Uh, just, so these are coming from uh, a regularized negative binomial model. So for each gene, we try to figure out the parameters of a negative binomial distribution, but then the second step, there is a regularization. So they think genes with a similar behavior should also have similar parameters. So you can see in the top right, all these parameters are very different. There's a lot of variability between the different genes, but after regularization, you get something that's pretty smooth. Uh, and in the bottom, uh, so this was a function of two things, the number, the total number of reads in a cell and the average, or the, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the average expression for that gene. And this is a pretty smooth looking function. So uh, we can, uh, this is nonlinear, as we see. I mean, it's estimated from the data, but it's pretty smooth and pretty easy to estimate. So all we need to do 
is basically just look, make a lookup in this image that compresses very nicely. So we uh, quickly, we just store a low resolution of this and do a bilinear lookup in it. And we have a super good uh, estimation of how that matrix should look like. Uh, and in terms of matrices, the B2 in the middle would be that small image. And on the left side is just uh, a matrix for deciding how to look up for the genes, and on the, the right side, how to look up for the, the cells. So that would have two non-zero values in every column, super, super sparse, and same for B1 and B3. So, so we can store, again, this super efficiently. It's a little bit more than the uh, centering, but it's still, compared to the sparse matrix, this is essentially for free. It takes almost no memory. Um, so the take-home message, I mean, this idea, you see it in many different disciplines that you approximate something with sparse plus low rank, but I think maybe here it's really somehow more hands-on how we re reach to this uh, matrix. Uh, so we can, I cannot think of a reasonable use case where you couldn't do this, because if you have structure in your data, it has to kind of work like this. If, it, if that second part wasn't low rank, you would have some very, very strange uh, dependencies on, on your data that, that just doesn't make biological sense. Um, so, a very quick look at the matrix multiplication again, because we need to do that right, or we have lost uh, everything, right? If we, uh, so, uh, we could get very far here by, by basically mimicking the, the example from before and distributing over the sum and evaluating right to left. It, it will solve most of our cases uh, and make sure we choose a good order of the operations that is cheap to evaluate. But uh, there are some edge cases where this doesn't work out. So uh, the way I have approached this is um, some of you might have heard of the matrix chain optimization problem, uh, which is to figure out the right way of, of evaluating uh, matrix multiplication if you have n matrices. Uh, and that's, that's for dense matrices. Here it's a bit uh, more complicated because we, our matrices have properties. They can be sparse, they can be transposed, they can be di diagonal. Um, so it, it becomes messy, but we can basically, we can still do it with dynamic programming, which is the straightforward way of thinking about this. Um, and we can use things we know. Like it's, we still start by distributing over the sum because we constructed the sum to avoid uh, creating large dense matrices. So we kind of know that we don't need to, to check that. So then we just need to handle each one of these terms, which is a product of matrices. As I said, it becomes, it becomes messy with all these different combinations and transposes, but it's still easily to formulate, easy to formulate it within the dynamic programming framework. Um, and we cannot do it uh, perfectly, but we don't need to do it. We know we can gain orders of magnitude by doing it roughly the right way, so heuristics will do here to evaluate, like, to decide the order of the cost when we have different kinds, etc. cetera. Um, and then uh, the second use case where we really need the dynamic programming is this sum of squares that's needed to compute uh, the standard deviation, for instance, if we want to normalize on that, or to do statistical tests. This is one of the key components. Um, so, I mean, if, if we had a dense matrix, this is just computing the variance or the yeah, sum of the squared of the elements for each gene. Uh, but here, that becomes a lot more messy. I have ex uh, I'm showing it as the diagonal of this expression, and we expand that. Uh, and the, the thing is that we get all of these expressions that's diagonal of a product. So we run dynamic programming until we have just two matrices left. And then we have a special case for the final operation because we don't need to, I think the, the second, the bottom right here, to compute the diagonal of A transpose times B, well, we don't need to compute the off-diagonal elements. So we, the, the cheapest computation is the one you don't do. So, so just skip that. And then if you have a, the same matrix, it's, it's even, uh, that's how you would do it in the dense case, basically. So, so this is very easy base case kind of thing. I want to very quickly show the projection part. Uh, so here is typically how would you, you load, I'm loading some healthy data. 
uh, data from healthy donors and analyze it with a standard pipeline, more or less. This is bone marrow data, and it kind of shows a nice way how the different cells mature. Uh, and then but we can just load the counts, and by, by one uh, command, we can project. So this is uh, data from a uh, cancer patient now that we project in to see how, w which healthy cells are these uh, leukemia cells most similar to. So, and then it's colored by where this, the number of cells that end up in different places. Uh, so I think this is very easy to use, just one command and you get the whole, it takes care of the whole thing for you. Um, and it can do this because it has saved a model, basically trains the model for everything in the base data set, and then you just apply the models one by one. And this is something I've not seen in other packages, and it's really useful because it is tricky if you want to do it by yourself. The devil is in the details. If you normalize in the wrong way, you didn't train on the, other, on the base data set, you get rid of all your signal and you end up with analyzing nonsense. Uh, so it's very nice to do this um, and that's taken care of under the hood. And then uh, another way to show this is that uh, we can also visualize where the cells are different. So we projected them, where are the most, which healthy cells are they most similar to? Yeah, they're most similar to these ones, but actually they're not similar to anything at all, so we can make a score for that. And I've not seen anyone else use the local outlier factor, which is a very nice way to measure that. How well does this fit here? And then we can get an indication of like, well, these cells are really different from the healthy cells. That's where you maybe should focus your attention. So um, to summarize, uh, it's a fast and memory efficient uh, tool for analyzing single cell expression data. It, it supports more things than I had time to talk about here. Uh, and there are things that are not quite yet in the public package, but is on the way. The, it's basically done and I have a lot of future ideas. So please talk to me to help me find out what I should focus my attention to, what I should develop, and uh, that's it. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, let's take questions. This is very, very cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, one thing, this is maybe in your plotting utilities uh, section, but. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are immunologists that are used to doing flow cytometry data, and they, they're sort of like moving into single cell. And one of the things that I hear a lot is, I would love to be able to take my projection and then like gate the way that you do with facts, draw a circle around a cluster, and pull that data out to like zoom in on it. Um, and I'm wondering how how hard that would be using using this kind of. Uh, like once you get the so that should be pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm not very much a fan of gating strategies, but uh, but I am I am a fine fan of the uh, interactive analysis, and I think that's something that I mean that's one of the key reasons I developed this package because if it takes you seconds to generate a plot compared to doing it overnight, then you will generate multiple plots. You will ask a new question about the data. Well, if I only look at these cell types, if I remove this patient, does that change everything or not? And, and that's the kind, same kind of question. So um, I think now in, with the package extensions, I didn't get to use it yet. I didn't have time. But that's, that makes it trivial to start adding things like plotting function that will not, if you don't use, use it, it will not make it slower. Uh, so, so it really makes it easier to expand in like all these different directions. So that's definitely something you could do. Something like Machia would be perfect here to do the interactive stuff and, and pretty straightforward, I would say. What was, like, your, before you got to the matrix expressions, what was like your step? What was your uh, first version? Did you have a very popular? Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it really, it was very much a gradual thing growing up, I, I, growing out of just maybe starting with thing, I mean, there's so much structure here, it would be, it's stupid to throw away all of that and just work with a dense matrix and then trying out some fixed expressions like, okay, if I just remove the mean or I just do uh, the single cell transform, like what does that lead to? And then you're just starting to realize, well, I just manipulate and move these things around. It's, it's, 
it's faster for me to develop if I have like a, a data structure, I can store that in just of special cases everywhere and it makes it, I, I mean, it makes in the end makes for less code because you, you don't need to solve the special cases, you, you have a general way to handle it. And um, you, you would pretty, get pretty far, but it would be frustrating. Everything you, every time you want to add something new, you would, ah, well, now I need to add everywhere in the code, I need to change this and here it just comes for free uh, more or less. All right, well, um, if there are any more questions, um, I also have a question myself. Um, how did you find, just from a, you know, engineering performance perspective, uh, how, how difficult did you find it to actually optimize this package and get it to where you wanted it to be performance-wise in Julia? So I, I, I really enjoy working on these kinds of problems. Um, so uh, I, I got, when I got the main ideas, I got pretty quickly to a point where I see this is fruitful, this is worth uh, doing. And then of course there's a, a long way from there, but I, feel, I felt confident quite early that this is a path that, that's worth taking. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, another question? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just, just briefly, I saw that uh, in your uh, future uh, parts of the package, that project, future ideas, you mentioned you have exec, and I wonder why uh, I think it needs to be like a separate feature. Or it, it, it's a tiny, uh, yeah, sorry, the question is about a taxic, a single cell ataxic. So it, it's a tiny thing really. Uh, it's okay. just that when you, when you do this, I, I've not really analyzed myself, but, but w you get for each sample, you will get like here are the peaks, here are my variables. And then you have many patients and you have different set of variables. So you need to first have one step where you, you m merge the peaks, you figure out this, uh, are peaks that are make sense across the data sets and then you convert variables to a common. So because to compare two patients, you need to work with the same set of variables. Once you have done that, it's a perfect match for the package, but suddenly you have 300,000 variables instead of 30,000. Uh, so uh, that's, and even more sparse. So, yeah. Thanks. All right, let's have another round of applause for our speaker.